All right. How does, on what does an individual base his judgments? How, what are his norms? How are they validated? How do you know if you're right about your norms? Um, what's the interest of such norms for the philosophy of science in general? That's a really tough one. It's like, well, you have norms and expectations as a human being, and because of that, they, they have a determining influence on the manner in which you conduct science. So, for example, here's one of the problems with the straight realist view. So, we could be having a discussion, and I could say, well, you know, that tile is to the right of that tile. And then I could say, well, this brick is smaller than that brick. And then I could say, you know, the roof is white, really quite white there, and, and it's dark back there. And like after about 20 statements like that, you're just going to want to slap me. And the reason for that is that, well, those statements are perfectly valid representations of fact, but there's an infinite number of facts, and most of them are irrelevant. And that's the thing. That's the thing. The facts have to be relevant. Like, if you come to a lecture and all the person does is tell you irrelevant facts, what happens? You've been in lots of lectures like that. What happens? Well, you start fantasizing about something that might be more worthwhile. <laughs> you know, or you go to sleep, because your brain is a lot smarter than you are. It figures, hell, if all we're going to get exposed to here is an infin infinite number of irrelevant facts, we might as well have a nap until something important happens. So, it's true. It's exactly how it works. Now, this is going to get big. Isn't that what happens next? No. So, okay, so... And then, how does the fact that the child children think differently um, affect our presumption of fact itself? Children live in the world. They think differently about the world, but yet they survive. And so, well, I already mentioned a partial solution to that. Adults intercede, you know, around the edges, around the borders. Children do this all the time, eh? So, it's called referencing. Um, and they do it two ways. So, for example, if you're in a room with your child, maybe two, eh? And a mouse runs across, the child will orient to it, watch it, track it, that's pretty much unconscious. And the mother, let's say, will do that too. And then the child looks at the mouse and then looks at the mother. And the reason is, is because the child doesn't know what a mouse is. And so then it looks at the mother to read from the mother's face, which is a projection screen of emotions, how to classify the mouse in terms of import. And if the mother is like all calm about it and gives the kid a pat, it's like, you know, okay, whatever, you know. Not danger. That's what the mouse is first. Danger, not danger. It's way after that that it's a mouse. You think, no, it's a mouse to begin with. It's like, these things are not so straightforward. They are not so straightforward. So anyways, if the mother climbs up on the table and has a screaming fit, then the child's already prepared, because of this anomaly, to be emotionally responsive. The child looks at the mother's face, it's got terror on it, the, mouse, the child thinks, small danger, big danger! It's like, phobia, phobia, phobia. Now, all kids, that won't happen to, because some are, are very emotionally robust. But if their ver child's very high in neuroticism, trait neuroticism, the probability that they'll develop a permanent, semi-permanent fear of the mouse is extraordinarily high. And that's what should happen, because the mother tells you what the mouse is, and, and the face doesn't say mouse. It says safety danger. And that's the first thing you want to know about something. Is it safe or is it dangerous? And that's a tricky one, eh? Because whether something is safe or dangerous is not exactly an objective fact. There's a guy named J.J. Uh, Gibson who wrote a book called An Ecological Approach to Visual Perception, which I would highly recommend. And his claim in that book, it's a real work of genius, I believe, is that when you, see, when you walk towards a cliff, you don't see a cliff. You don't see a cliff and infer danger. What you see is a falling off place and you infer cliff. And you can tell that, some of you have vertigo, you go up on the 26th floor out into a balcony and it's like, you don't want to go near the edge. Maybe you feel like you're going to throw yourself over, because people have that kind of, what if, what if I fell or what if I jumped over? It's like, stay away from that. It's like, that perception of the danger precedes your perception of the balcony and the object. Now, you know, that's how your brain is wired. The danger's first, the object's second. So, in people with blindsight, who I've talked about before, who think they're blind, they can't see, and they tell you that, they can still detect fearful faces. And you can detect their detection by measuring their skin conductance. And so their eyes are mapping right onto their fear and reflex systems without any intermediary of objective perception whatsoever. So, don't be thinking that what you see in the world is the objective world and then infer its meaning. It could easily be exactly backwards, and it looks like, if you look at how the brain is set up, that it is, in fact, ac actually backwards, or at least parallel. But, but, the, but the danger, not danger, 
perception has to be very, 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 very fast. And so it precedes the more elaborate cognitive interpretations, even the perceptions, because it actually takes a while to see something, because it's really complicated to see something. And so you can't just wait around to see the damn thing before you act. You're just not fast enough. So they say if you're a pro tennis player, the time it takes the ball to leave your opponent's racket to get to you is not long enough for you to plan any motor act. So what you're doing is you've got the you disinhibit the motor act by looking at the stance of your opponent and watching. And by the time they hit it, you're already prepared for the response because you're just not. It's coming at 120 miles an hour. It's like it's going 50 feet. You don't have the reflexes for it. So your 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 eyes are making your body ready without in some sense without your conscious perception you become conscious if you make a mistake right in fact that's kind of what consciousness is for it's like detect error fix detect error fix that's consciousness it's not plan what you're going to do next although it's not that simple either <laughs>